We're in Luke 14. I should st say right off the bat, I've been battling a, a cough. Uh, I'm in entering my fourth week uh, with it. So congratulations are in order. Uh, caught it from my brother-in-law in, at a wedding in a Chicago family wedding. And uh, we always blame my brother-in-law, don't we? Uh, <laughs> He, he got it from his son-in-law. There's another target. But uh, David and Marcy, you've had a, I know, a difficult week, joyful in many ways, but uh, you've had a difficult year. And, uh, but mom and dad have had a great year, so. Uh, but we want to finish the 14th <clears throat> chapter of uh, the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be reading verses 25 through uh, 35. It's important, uh, especially with some of you who have not been sitting in this class, uh, to remember what Jesus has been uh, doing. He's been addressing himself to the general uh, topic of following him as a disciple, uh, not, not just walking after him, listening to him, watching, looking for miracles, looking uh, for uh, bread uh, to eat, but following him as a disciple. Uh, he had become a public figure, and so people were uh, following him in a sense, but he wanted them to know the importance of, of following him uh, with a full commitment, or we might even say a true commitment. And we observed in our previous lesson, uh, it's been some time now, but the repetition <clears throat> of his command uh, to come to him. It occurs three times in those verses uh, 16 through 24. Uh, those whom he would invite to follow him should actually come to him and not falter in their commitment. And I mentioned last time there's this backdrop of evangelism uh, in those verses. <clears throat> now, in these verses that follow, he moves from that general call to come, which we should interpret as his invitation to discipleship, uh, to the warning or advisement concerning what they should expect when they come. So, uh, here, here's, what's, here's what you should expect if you do uh, make that commitment. They ought to come to him with their eyes wide open uh, to the cost of following after Christ. It will require the highest devotion and commitment and a kind of abandonment of self in order to make Jesus one's first loyalty. So let's read it beginning in verse 25. Now large crowds were going along with him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So you see what Warren, Warren always reads the passage before he comes. <laughs> Verse 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. And therefore, salt is good, but even if salt, if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? <coughs> it is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. <coughs> he who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
I've mentioned uh, before, and I hope you'll uh, forgive me, but it's, it's just too good in my mind not to mention again, uh, this shopping center developer from uh, Georgia that I met a few years ago. He was quite the character, as you might not be surprised to know. It turned out uh, we learned each other, we, each other, we were Christians, we were believers, and so our conversations soon turned to more spiritual type things. And eventually, somehow, we got off on uh, the trials and difficulties that come upon us sometimes in the Christian life. How does that happen? Uh, I started the book of Job uh, this week. Maybe some of you did too, reading that same read through the Bible deal. But, and so in, in his colorful way, um, this developer <clears throat> described his own conversion and the years that, that followed. He said this, he said, I went down to the dock. That was his uh, term for his conversion. He was talking about his conversion. He said, I went down to the dock to get on the cruise ship. And when I got there, I found out it was a battleship. <laughs> That's an apt description of the experience of, the, of a disciple of Christ, of a person called to follow him. It oftentimes resembles a battle. When God in Christ grants <clears throat> new birth to a sinner, he promises them many wonderful things, both in the here and now and in the eternity to come. And while that life and pursuit of Jesus is characterized in the scriptures and realized by every believer as one full of joy, peace, hope, contentment, riches, fruitfulness, and fulfillment, nowhere did Jesus promise a life without struggle, disappointment, and suffering. Neither did the apostles uh, hear them speak. First Paul, Romans 8, 16 through 17, the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I'm aware, and I mean this sincerely, that we don't really enjoy reading these verses I'm, I'm reading. At least I don't. Uh, Philippians 1, 29. <coughs> for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake. Philippians 3:10. Uh, the, that great verse where Paul uh, tells us he wanted to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. James, everyone has this memorized, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and so on. Peter, uh, beloved, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. An ordeal. Nobody wants to go through an ordeal today, tomorrow, this week, th this month. No one wants to go through an ordeal. Don't be surprised, though, at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange things were happening to you, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. There is a cost that comes with discipleship. Uh, the follower of Jesus will enlist, knowingly or unknowingly, in the Lord's army, and there will be spiritual warfare. How could such a thing be? It is because the disciple of Christ is commanded to follow in his steps. <clears throat> As the author of Hebrews put it, we fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, uh, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him. Uh, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It's understandable 
uh, that a person who makes the decision <clears throat> to come to Christ and follow after him might not have a firm grasp on the minefields that await him down the road. In the elation and sudden joy uh, that overwhelms the newly born again, it's forgivable for them to imagine that a pleasant cruise awaits rather than the possible sacrifice and spiritual war warfare uh, related more to a battleship. But in the verses we're studying today, we see clearly that the Lord did not fail to advise us of this. Uh, here <clears throat> is carrying our cross. Here is going to battle. Uh, here is renouncing self in order to dedicate our loyalty to Jesus. Well, Luke relates for us in the opening verse 25 how large crowds were going along with Jesus. We already know <clears throat> both from the Gospel of Luke and other Gospels, especially John, that there was this recurring pattern of crowds increasing in pace with the Lord's notoriety, uh, but then dramatically falling off uh, once they learn more of what it would require of them to be his follower, as Jesus made clear the demands of discipleship. There was an ongoing winnowing process that from the Lord's perspective was intentional. <clears throat> That's indicated in the seeming severity of the guidance he gives them next, what Warren was referring to in, a, in his prayer. If anyone comes to me, he says, this is 26, <laughs> If anyone comes to me, now that's what he's been talking about. He's talking about people coming to him. And since these large crowds are all following him, he would have known that the question was running through their minds, should I come uh, to him and become his follower? I believe that. Uh, these huge crowds in the, in the hearts of those people, should I? Uh, come to him and be his follower. So he presents to them <clears throat> two characteristics of those who follow him. Two characteristics of those who follow him. Uh, this is the first in verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. <clears throat> Now we know immediately that all is not there that meets the eye. Uh, Jesus had already, already taught against literal hating of others, uh, and he rather commanded that we should uh, love others. We, we should even love our enemies. The Ten Commandments, one of them is honor your father and your mother. Well, if you hate them, that's to dishonor your father and your mother. He had even advised the curious lawyer uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, uh, love for oneself. It's written in the law. He said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, this is yet another Semitic form of expression we see in the gospel narratives as we would expect to see. <clears throat> Most everyone we meet up with in the gospels are Jews so it should not surprise us to hear them speaking like Jews. In this case, uh, using hatred as a way to express the matter of degree of love. <clears throat> in comparison to the love for God and his son, a person should hold, one's affection for family and self would seem like hatred. In comparison, it would seem like hatred. Put another way, it's to love less. Uh, Leon Morris explained the thought as giving one's first loyalty to Christ. I like that. Giving one's first loyalty to Christ ahead of others. Our love for him and devotion to him should make our love for oneself and family pale in comparison. Uh, there's a parallel passage in Matthew 10. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but listen to this. I think it'll help us to grasp the, the meaning here. Uh, there in Matthew 10, verse 37, Jesus says, <clears throat> He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. 
Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, well, then I'll start slobbering all over it. Uh, I'll take advantage of that. Thank you. I'll get you a tissue. No, I brought water in. I think it sounds worse than it is, but now you made me lose my place. <laughs> but it's in Matthew 10, verse 37. Jesus says, he who loves father and mother more than me, more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. It's love and devotion in relation to other loves that Jesus has in mind. And that's what Jesus was saying. It's, it's the first characteristic he points to. We, we saw a good illustration of it last week in Mike's lesson with Jonathan and uh, David, the, the characterization of Jonathan's love <clears throat> for David. He loved him more than his own father. Yes, he loved his father, but in comparison, you might say he hated uh, Saul. <clears throat> Passages like this, uh, which on the surface seem to contradict sound reasoning, are often listed as, quote, difficult sayings in biblical studies, entire books. Uh, you, can, you have them in your library, some of you do, difficult sayings in the Bible. But it's only difficult, this one is anyway, if you're not willing to think. Uh, the initial shock or surprise of reading them is intended, is, is, is intended to emphasize the underlying truth. I read of one uh, confused critic who seized upon this text in an attempt to discredit Jesus, who he wrote, <clears throat> was trampling underfoot everything that is human, blood and love and country despising the healthy limits of man's nature, abolishing all natural ties. I think he's running for Congress uh, in the next election. Uh, when unbelieving, vicious critics of Jesus and of Christianity uh, seek to justify their own biases, they rarely let facts get in the way. Uh, the man had completely misinterpreted the text. He had failed to think hard enough because he didn't want to. He was more interested in slandering the one who will one day be his final judge. So this is not a hard saying. Uh, but now notice, a, a person with such a deficit of love for Jesus, he says, and I do want you to notice this, he says, cannot be my disciple. He's going to repeat that phrase in the next verse Whoever does not carry his own Christ, cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, uh, no one lives the Christian life perfectly. We need to recognize that because such verses as these often lead to disagreement and controversy over measuring a person's qualification to be identified as a follower of of Christ, and then we end up talking about such things as surrender and absolute unconditional commitment. But Jesus speaks not here of qualification to be his disciple. No one is qualified. In our debates over such topics as lordship salvation and on the other hand, uh, the minimum, the absolute minimum required to become a disciple of Christ, too often uh, we're focusing on judging others and we're refereeing in a way who is qualified to be a Christian and who is not. But the Lord spoke these words to individuals so that they might be able to judge for themselves whether their profession and the reality of their faith are real and whether they are qualified or not, not whether they are qualified or not, uh, but whether in their observable lives they are exhibiting the evidence that they are true children of God in Christ. And here Jesus uses the word cannot. Uh, in the parallel passage in Matthew 10, he substitutes is not worthy of me, cannot 
is not worthy. But again, no one is worthy. Uh, no one can and no one is worthy to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. These attributes of loving Christ above all else and in the next verse, carrying our own cross are not qualifications enabling men and women to be Christ's disciples, but rather the evidence that they are Christ's disciples. They are the evidence that the grace of God has been at work in their hearts, enabling them to do what they by nature are unable to do. And so Jesus would have his listeners uh, examine uh, the evidence and understand that becoming his disciple is not to be a casual thing, a uh, let's get together and uh, have, have a fellowship uh, meeting kind of a thing. Uh, it looks different than that. It looks like real commitment, unshakable commitment even, complete devotion. As William Hendrickson wrote, the type of loyalty that is so true and unswerving that every other attachment, even that to one's own life, must be subjected to it. The Lord was desiring to forestall any kind of empty or trite response to him and rather paint a true picture of what awaits his followers so that they would be entering not into a frivolous lark, but into a conscious advance commitment to him. It will be costly. It will be costly. Uh, so I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, verses 26 and 27 are, are very closely connected. And in verse 27, we move from uh, committing one's first loyalties uh, to Christ to the exorbitant cost of following him. It demands uh, cross-bearing. We've seen this before, so this is going to be a little bit repetitious, although we can't see it too often. In chapter 9 and verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So this is not a, a reference to a one-time event, a one-time sacrifice or some random unfortunate circumstance that one can look back upon with a sense of, of settled satisfaction. I did that. That's not what this is. <clears throat> For those living in uh, Jesus' day under Roman rule, it was not actually an uncommon thing to see a man carrying his cross in the company of some Roman soldiers. Everyone would have known where he was headed. Leon Morris wrote in his commentary that they knew they were on a one-way journey and they wouldn't be coming back. Uh, so taking up the cross signified the ultimate in self-denial, a willingness to die uh, for him if, if called to. And the Lord says it is to be the bent of our lives. Uh, we are to take up our cross daily. That means the attitude of the Christian, of you and me, is to be like Christ who did not waver in his determination to empty himself of his prerogatives. They were royal prerogatives and offer himself up voluntarily to suffer in obedience to his Father in whom he trusted completely and whom he loved. The suffering and sacrifice he endured on the cross points then to that which the believer must be willing to submit every day. We should not soft-pedal this. It is to live each day, not for self, but for Christ. That will require sacrifice and sincere devotion, energetic, energetic effort, and difficult decisions. <clears throat> it will be costly and may include loss, uh, replacing our own uh, priorities with his priorities. And since it is a cross Jesus 
figuratively suggests we carry it may even lead to physical suffering and even death. So Jesus was not looking for disciples who were blind to what they might be getting themselves into. Uh, counting the cost is important. So he uses two twin parables now <clears throat> in verses 28 through 32 to drive his point home. The first concerns a development project by a person who wishes to build some kind of a tower. Uh, the context making it clear <clears throat> that he intends it to be an impressive building uh, that will showcase his construction prowess. The second involves a king's dilemma when faced with an emerging battle with a, a hostile enemy king. You'll see the two parables make essentially the same point. Uh, which one of you, he asked, this is verse 28, when he wants to build a tower, uh, does not first sit down <clears throat> and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. And so you notice he begins this first parable <clears throat> with that little word for. But what is the for there for? It's because he's now providing a primary reason for would-be disciples to count the cost. This is a reason to count the cost. It's because one must take the time to be prepared for the endeavor lest you proceed haphazardly by leveling the land, doing the, the, the soil work, laying the foundation, only to come to the end of your resources and energies and end up making a fool of yourself. And people uh, begin to ridicule you. That happens in, in real life. I realize this may not apply to every believer equally. Some uh, flee to Christ out of desperate straits or in the flash of the brilliance of truth that comes to bear upon them. But for most, there is forethought. I'm thinking about this thing. Uh, the image the Lord uses is, is of first sitting down and thinking. It's always important to think. <laughs> and then there's careful calculation of just what all this step of faith will entail. And we will see verse 33 is going to enlarge on that. It is important to count the cost. And utilizing such a pragmatic illustration as calculating the cost of building a structure from start to finish reinforces the truth that becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ is not some pie in the sky a theory, but cold, hard reality, isn't it? It's a cold, hard reality. It's also wonderful, but it's, it can be a cold, hard reality. The second parable <clears throat> in verses 31 and 32 puts before us the prospect of a battle it is one king with his army against another king with his army. Uh, we're not told anything else other than that, except that one king has 10,000 troops and the other has 20,000. So there's a lopsided battle in uh, the offing. Nothing is said about one Marine being worth uh, 20 of the enemy or uh, 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 Navy SEALs being on one side and the other one doesn't have, or one having a 12th region of Aggies on their side and <laughs> poor, who was it last night? Tennessee. Poor Tennessee had no chance. I think I went to bed, but. <laughs> no, it's 20,000 against 10,000. And here again, the outmanned king is, is counseled to first sit down and consider whether he's strong enough. This is not optional for him as in the first parable in which the man chose to build a tower. Uh, this battle has been thrust on the king uh, because of enmity between the two. He cannot avoid the dreaded meeting and its certain carnage. So he sits down and he c considers uh, whether he is uh, strong enough or not. <clears throat> if he's a wise king, 
He will see the light before it's too late. He'll send an emissary and he'll negotiate some kind of a settlement so he's not destroyed. So he and his army are, are not destroyed. That is, he, he'll be reconciled to the strong king and become his servant and he'll do it quickly. If he's a foolish king, he'll, will, he'll ignore the obvious danger and rush in where angels dare to tread and receive a just recompense for his foolishness. <coughs> uh, both parables stress the necessity of careful calculation <coughs> to stop the rush of your life, to turn away from the tyranny of the falsely urgent and to sit down and think, at this moment, do I have what I need to make my way forward in this life? If I do not, what will it cost me to be sure? Well, Jesus' answer comes in verse 33. Uh, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his possessions. He's speaking to the attitude of the heart. Uh, this is no facile tactic of selling off all your material possessions, putting it all out in the yard, uh, leaving it there for three Saturdays in a row till it's all gone, and, and then putting yourself at the mercy and the inconvenience of others. That's not what this is. The key word here is the one translated give up. In my version, it is apotasamai, and it means something like to take leave of or to say goodbye to, okay? To say goodbye to something. When used of things, it's, it's easily translated to give up or to renounce personal ownership. But the broader meaning of the word has to do with releasing our hold on all we claim to be ours by right and ceding them to Christ. Henceforth, considering our relation to them as that of stewards, uh, handling them in trust for him. Yes, there's a sense of abandonment, <clears throat> but abandonment more in the sense of giving up self-claimed rights. Uh, that is what carrying our cross daily entails, the abandonment of all that vies in competition with the interests of Jesus and ultimately the abandonment even of ourselves. What Paul was speaking of in Galatians 2 verse 20 when he wrote that he had been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. When the Apostle Paul had been <clears throat> apprehended <clears throat> by Jesus and claimed for his own to be his servant, and as he told him to show him how much he must suffer for his name's sake, Paul said goodbye uh, to his past illusions of righteousness and to his relentless path to the top of the Jewish hierarchy and he took on a new life for Christ alone, reserving nothing of his old life and abandoning it for good. He is a great model for us. It's unattainable maybe, surely. He traded in self-righteousness and ambition for the honor and joy of knowing Christ and becoming his disciple and he didn't look back to borrow from an old illustration, they passed the offering plate and he plopped himself right down in it. And with that, uh, the final two verses of the Lord's exhortation, verses 34 and 35, introduce what seems possibly at first glance to be something new, except that he introduces it with that word again, therefore, now in the Greek, it's a little different word for therefore than the last four, but it means the same thing. Therefore, salt is good, 
<clears throat> but even if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, salt was an uh, important enough uh, figure to our Lord that he used it at least three times in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, in Mark chapter uh, 9, and here in this passage in uh, Luke. So, salt had two primary uses in Jesus' day. Uh, one was a flavoring agent, um, much as it is commonly used today. A, a good cook uh, will often sneak into his or her preparation of a dish, <clears throat> a dash or more of salt. No one will know the difference. It'll make it taste better. And in this pre-refrigerated era, salt was also used as a preservative to keep things from, from spoiling. Technically, salt, so sodium chloride, uh, cannot lose its f flavor for you uh, techies, uh, for you scientific sorts out there. I know it can't lose its flavor and become tasteless, but the salt used in the regions in which Jesus traveled was often impure, uh, mixed either purposely or by necessity with uh, various substances. It was often obtained by evaporation from the Dead Sea, which of course uh, contained uh, salt, uh, but not pure salt. And such contaminated salt, once the actual salt uh, had been dissolved away from it, would end up uh, having a bitter taste, useless as Jesus says, for the manure pile or anything else that's thrown out. And the, well, Jesus likely had in mind both uh, salt's preservative value and the spice that it brought uh, to life. He's been advocating <clears throat> for a life devoted to him and by using the imagery of salt, he reinforces uh, the positive effects such dedication can have on others and on the world about. It can be a powerful agent of the kingdom in many ways. We season uh, the lives of others uh, we serve as agents of preservation by tra the transforming effect of the gospel upon others, upon our neighborhoods, upon society in, in general. Uh, but that kind of committed life, uh, sadly, can wane. And that's what the therefore is there for. Uh, the recognition that that kind of devotion, that kind of seasoning effect, that kind of energy uh, it, it, can, it can wane. It's not uncommon. Uh, we're, we're prone to weariness and, and, and we're prone to distraction. It's not uncommon for the dedicated Christian disciple uh, laboring as a servant of the Lord to come to the place in his or her life in which you're really just looking for a soft place to lay down. I get that. And Jesus now warns us against that kind of lethargy. It's a reminder that though the Lord may be generous in granting us some of the pleasures of this life, the world is not our home. In his book, uh, The Problem of Pain, uh, C.S. Lewis uh, addressed this. He, he wrote, the, the settled happiness and security which we all desire, we do. <coughs> settled happiness and security. We all desire it. God withholds that from us, typically, by the very nature of the world that we live in. Uh, but joy, pleasure, and merriment, he has scattered broadcasts. Sometimes we have to translate Lewis. He has scattered broadcasts. I think he's distributed it generously and, and, and widely. We're never safe, but we have plenty of fun and some ecstasy. It's not hard to see why the security that we crave would uh, teach us to rest our hearts in this world and pose an obstacle to our return to God. But here's, here's Lewis again, but a few moments of happy love, a landscape, a symphony, a merry meeting with our friends, 
a bath or a football match have no such tendency. Our Father refreshes us on the journey with some pleasant ends, but will not encourage us to mistake them for home. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. <clears throat> Perhaps you can identify with that. I know that you can. We all enjoy the idyllic uh, inn where we may rest and read and indulge in diversions, but they can easily take our hearts captive. And the question Jesus posed to the large crowd on this day was, am I your first loyalty? Or are you absorbed with yourself? I saved an article Marvin Olasky wrote about 20 years ago. Uh, uh, Olasky was the founding editor of World Magazine. Many of you know Marvin. He quoted a speaker at a conference who addressed himself to the idea of what it means to flourish as a human being in our society. And the speaker had said at this conference <clears throat> that it had shriveled to meaning no more than leading an experien experientially satisfying life. But Olasky pointed to the Bible, which he said shows us the way out of self-absorption by telling us to imitate Jesus who was absorbed by the needs of others. We face nothing that he did not face. William Barclay observed somewhere that Jesus promised his disciples three things, that they would be completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. In return, he promises us that our days will be spent doing what matters most. May we all be found uh, to the end, attending to our first loyalty as we carry our own cross, whatever it happens to be, and following closely after him, no matter the cost, the expense on that day will turn out to be laughable, laughable, overshadowed, as Paul would say, by an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Let's pray. Lord, uh, we fall far short of these exhortations from you um, to carry our own cross, uh, to give up, to say goodbye to all our possessions, <clears throat> to make you our first loyalty. But we would that you would transform us in that way by your spirit, that we would be salt uh, in uh, this world, leading others to faith in you, bringing others into your kingdom, uh, uh, making your kingdom uh, more palatable, more refreshing uh, by the lives that we live. Uh, keep us from uh, fear of, of cost. Keep us from uh, self-absorption. Give us, Lord, greater uh, desire to serve you and sacrifice for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.